Modern day Hunter Valley houses a complex mix of farms, vineyards, open cut mines and horse studs interspersed with country towns of significant character and colour, some restful and others relentlessly busy in matters of both work and play. But there is so much more to this land, stretching from Cessnock up to Mararundi and out to Casillas, than meets the untrained eye. Deep within the rugged bushland and even deeper into Australia's distant past, lies a beautifully and prolifically illustrated story. Scattered along the Indigenous people's songlines are countless examples of ancient rock art that have been clinging tenaciously to sandstone outcrops for thousands of years. It is the cave art we are exploring today, and in particular the awe-inspiring figure of Biami. University of Newcastle natural history illustration lecturer and archaeological illustrator Dr Bernadette Drabsch led a field studies trip to Biami Cave in June 2016 and charged her students with the task of observing, sketching and researching the rock art and its surrounding environment. Well, I'm hoping that it will achieve um, a sense of connection to these sites. And, uh, and I mean that in not connection just for the Indigenous people, but also for non-Indigenous people. I think it's uh, that it's part of all of our history, um, these sites, and I think it's something that we should promote and be proud of and um, you know I think visitors uh, have uh, sometimes a, a deeper res sense of respect for these sites than what we do and I just want um, all people who come um, to visit this area to realise it's an incredibly important um, you know, culturally rich area and by de developing that sense of connection um, by sharing these sites to um, a broader range of people I think will help with their conservation. The depiction in the cave is that of a formidable presence, with long arms outstretched in the familiar fluid rhythm of a wedgetail eagle's wings, Biami silently oversees the valley and all of his creation. For student Christine Brent, analysing the individual motifs of the cave was an enlightening and emotive exercise. It's a site of historical significance for the Aboriginal people and also for the other New South Wales residents because it's one of the oldest uh, drawings or depictions of Bayami who is um, the creator above all. So he's a godlike, a god figure. Well, my role was to um, trace the motifs that are in that cave and compare them to other sites in the local area. I had a lot of um, help from Warren Taggart who came up there, he's an Aboriginal gentleman and he um, explained a lot of the uh, what the motifs meant and he has in fact communicated a lot with me since then. Not only of special significance to the Indigenous people, Biami Cave was listed on the New South Wales Heritage Register in 2015. According to the New South Wales Government's Office of Environment and Heritage, it is a rare and representative Indigenous rock art painting site. Large painted human figures, like that of Biami, which measures about 2.5 metres high, are rarely found among the thousands of rock art sites throughout New South Wales, with most featuring smaller painted or engraved images of animals and humans, and painted hand stencils like those that accompany our main figure here. Australian surveyor R. H. Matthews recognised the cave's significance back in the 1890s, describing the Biami depiction as the largest and most remarkable human figure I have yet met with amongst the cave paintings of New South Wales. Matthews, who was not a formally trained anthropologist, is today appreciated for his unflinching devotion to documenting the Aboriginal people, culture and sites throughout New South Wales, Victoria and southern Queensland. Among his myriad and detailed observations of Biami Cave, first published in 1893, were that 
The Hawkesbury sandstone is not very durable, even under the most favourable circumstances, and when located in damp situations and subject to much moisture, it crumbles away rapidly. It is owing to the very favourable situation of this cave that its walls are now apparently in very nearly the same state as when the drawings were made upon them. Student Lillian Webb has been investigating the art making processes of the original inhabitants, firstly by studying the available natural resources on the site. Part of the process was how they might have mixed the pigments, what kind of rock they used, uh, how they painted it and sort of the people that would be painting it as well. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to do two separate things in my infographic. Um, one is the reconstruction and that will be a painting of the cave and maybe some people uh, mixing up the paints and perhaps a little scene of the elders passing knowledge down to the younger generation. I had a bit of an idea of what I might see before I went to the cave site, but just going there I saw the kinds of timbers that were possibly available to them, the scale of the cave itself, um, uh, even, even the colours I had to sort of mix accurately. I also found a lot of um, ochre stones on the ground, lots of colourful stones all around the cave and surrounding areas, and also the kinds of binders they would have used. Because the Biami figure himself is a really bright red um, I found a really bright red sap in a lot of the trees around there and I thought it seems like a possibility that they might have used that sap as a binder. Mm -hmm. It could have also, they also use blood and fat and other things like that. Mm. Um, but yeah, I thought that just getting that idea of the area really consolidated what I thought about it. So. Mm -hmm. Student Aisha McComb collected, sketched and identified plant specimens on the day of the group's visit and set about investigating ways in which the original inhabitants would have used them for medicinal purposes. So the fern was used for, like they broke off the small shoots and used for an insect um, uh, sting nose kind of solution, uh, which you grubs used to be ground down and then uh, placed on the, on the saw and that would have an antiseptic property. And so too they used uh, bark for bandages. Uh, so um, paper bark was used for a bandage. Um, gum leaves are obviously uh, good for your throat. I did a little sculpey of um, a hollowed out knot in, in the tree and so they used that to, to steep in the water overnight. And then they'd also, another method was to grind. This was much larger in life, so this is just like a little sculpey. <laughs> so they would like grind like mortar and pestle, um, for example the witchetty grubs. I never realised, but where I, my grandparents were given land on the other side of the Barrington Tops, um, they have those in the rocks there. And I had no idea that that was from the, the Aboriginal culture that they were used. Um, I knew they weren't natural, but I didn't realise that they were, they were part of the Aboriginal culture. And it really made me feel a great connection to the land. And I felt um, very humbled by the people that were before us. I think the most important thing I've learnt from it is that, that it's all interconnected and for them there is no removal of them from the landscape. The landscape and them are one. The, um, when they die they don't grieve in the same way that we do. If a baby is um, stillborn that baby has just been taken back to the, to the earth and that baby will then be born again in a different spirit. So it's just a really interesting way of looking at everything and, um, and a way of survival I guess. Um, and they're connected to the stars, they're connected to the earth, they're connected to the animals. So there's no separation and I love that about the culture that I'm now learning about. Indigenous people had been at one with the valley for tens of thousands of years before white settlement. Subsequent decolonisation, the land on which Biami Cave stands was first granted in 1839. Current owner Rodney Smith's family have lived on and worked the land here since 1912. Dad was at uh, Mason Dew. That's all I can remember is Mason Dew. That's the other side of Singleton. Yeah. And then, and then he always wanted his own farm, so he he worked at Bulga for for only a couple of years, and then um, then he had the chance to buy this off my grandfather. Rodney and his wife Nolene, a former city girl, have been here since 1975, operating a dairy farm for many years. 
Rodney then turned to beef cattle, among other things, and is as content on the land now as he was as a wide-eyed boy exploring every nook and cranny of his grandparents' property. I used to mow. That's how old I am. <laughs> I used to mow the lucerne. Um, you grew the lucerne to feed the, the cattle. Like it was a dairy farm then, you know. And, uh, and I used to mow the lucerne with two horses. Not, no machinery. <laughs> well, I think we did have a tractor, but I used two horses. I can just remember that. I was probably only nine years old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You um, went to that school too, didn't you? Yeah. Well, that's where I went to school. Yeah. yeah. And then before <laughs> high school, that's up yeah, to six but we'd, Dad worked hard and we used, we used to have to help him before school and after school. They don't do that these days. <laughs> Rodney and Nolene's children and grandchildren too have been blessed with a country upbringing and have been afforded the freedom to explore and play and learn from the land. It's also good for the children to grow up because they learn. I mean, they, they drive cars and made, they all have motorbikes and they learn the road rules and everything. And, what, what it's like to drive on dirt roads and things like that. A lot of city children don't learn. Mm. And they, they learn it from about 10. Mm. Yes. And they're ready to get their licence. They, they, boys and girls, they all learn. Living on the site of ancient Aboriginal rock art has added another dimension to the lives of the Smiths. And the privilege is not lost on them. I didn't really realise how significant it was, you know, to... That's right. But now we get people every day to look at it. Every, every day, you know. If I stop what I'm doing, I'll never get anything done because there's that many people come, you yeah. know. And they, it's interesting yeah. too because they were talking about when they were getting, one of Rodney's cousins who lives in town, it's at Helen, and she said, but we used to play in it as kids. And yeah. they said, you didn't? I said, yeah, we did. Which is somewhere that they played. Yeah. It wasn't yeah, just part no, of the it farm. Wasn't, it wasn't recognised then as much as it is now. Very important as it is now, you know. Mm. Like it's, a, it's, it's a real landmark. It's, it's a world landmark, really, you know, mm. for, for as far as mm. Aboriginals go. Yeah. You know. It was, because yeah. we had one lot that came on Wednesday. Oh, there mm. are other places around, like down Wollombi Road there. And, and they uh, found one with, with some of the there. Some of the drawings are actually carved into the rock. You That's know where they chipped the rock, and and uh, and by Amy's footprints. Kind they of actually, one of them. they actually, uh, the government when it, when it was recognised, the government sent uh, people out and dug yeah. archaeologists or whatever they call them, um, and they did find the implements there. So it's all fair dinkum, you know. It's not no one just painted it there. <laughs> You've got to picture the earth up, right up. Like, that's over 2,000 years old, and the erosion has just taken the earth from... They got a, you got a picture the earth was up there so they could paint that, that high, you know. Yeah, yeah. 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 we've yeah. had a corroboree here. Yeah, we've had a corroboree, and they... When, when was that? On, uh, to last the, year, wasn't it? They, they can dance better than we can, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I like dancing. Yeah. <laughs> Rodney and Nolene have a strong working relationship with the Wanarua elders and are often on hand to chat to the many visitors who call in to see the cave paintings. Conrad Turnbull was one such visitor on our day of filming. As a young kid, I was about 12, when my grandfather rang the owners of the land to bring me out so we could have a look at the, the cave. Um, I just remember from the, the phone call, uh, the description my father gave of the cave and what was in there um, and then we came out and, and saw it and uh, we never come back today with my wife 30 years on to see exactly the same thing but broad, broader view of the Aboriginal heritage today I've been taught about more of the markings why there's the larger eyes and the belly etc gives it a bit more meaning and uh, just fortunate enough that it's been preserved me to look at now. To shift away from here would be a yeah. disaster, I think. <laughs> There's no plans to move. Yeah. So I said, I don't can't imagine him in a little flat or a little house, a little house in town or anything. 
<laughs> no, I think he'd be no. very frustrated, I think. Get me quickly. No. You need to be out here in the middle of the day and no more. It's just tranquility, just beautiful sitting out here.